what's really interesting too is like <laughs> when when Jesus um you know people say hey I'm I'm Christian you're not I this is one thing that happened when I was in Catholic school I'm like but there's like a billion Buddhists out there and there's like a like another billion Hindus out there yeah. are they all just damned to hell because they just weren't lucky enough Mm -hmm. To find Jesus? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Well, there's more. There's another logical fallacy that I would put to my Christian friends when I was coming out of Christianity was like, I can't rock with this message because your God is a total loser. <laughs> according <laughs> according to you, yeah, only yeah. Christians are going to heaven. Right. That's what you say you believe. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the logic of that. If at best we could say a quarter of the world is Christian, which it's much less than that. But let's give the best, most generous estimate that 25% of the world pre pre presents themselves as a Christian. And let's forget that every denomination says that all the other ones are heretics and going to hell. <laughs> all the 30,000 denominations all say we're the only correct one. But let's assume they're all correct. Mm -hmm. And that if you're just a Christian of any flavor, you're going to heaven. <laughs> Even in that best case scenario, the devil beats God three to one. Right. The devil takes 75% of God's children to the eternal torture chamber and says, Neener, 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 right. I got your children. Right. And God has to be satisfied with a measly quarter of them. Mm -hmm. That's not the God I know. You know, not only do I not know a God that loses to the devil, I don't know a God, I don't know a universe where there is a devil <laughs> right. in the sense of there's a second power called Satan who opposes God's power, and it's God versus the devil in this universe, and they're always duking it out. But God created Satan, but it's that's like, another story. In, in, in the universe that Jesus preached, in the universe that I experienced, there's only one power. There's only one Source. God. Yeah. The Old Testament says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. There is none else beside me. So even the invention of the devil is a deviation from the truth of what Jesus taught and what the Old Testament teaches, that there is no other God, there is no other power. And yet we give, Christianity gives the devil so much power, which was another one of my big contentions at that age. And the, the other thing is that the Old Testament um, God, he, I always found him to be very insecure um, and also, you know, have anger issues. Extremely, yeah. Extreme anger issues, very insecure. You must bow down to me. You must learn my, it, it was just like, why create, like, imagine if you were telling your kid, mm -hmm. you must bow down Obey to me. Obey me or else. Obey me or else, which is <laughs> maybe many of our parents <laughs> and our grandparents For had sure. to do something like that. But but generally, like at a, a <clears throat> high, high level, like, if not, I will smite you. I will kill you. Yeah. I will, like, it, it, it seems so ungodlike. Where's there room for love in that equation? Right. There's no, like, is, is there love in the Old Testament? Like, is, is there much? There's a lot of fear. I mean, there's fear a the Lord. There's a lot of fear, but there's not a lot of love. Not a lot. If, if I, it's in there, and the, some of the Psalms talked about, hey, you know, maybe loving God's the best thing to do, and that is the first commandment, right? Is love the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. But they had gotten so caught up in fearing God because of the wrath and all the, you know, every ancient culture believed that their gods were responsible for their victories and their defeats. You know, they gave credit to their gods when they won a battle. When they lost a battle, they saw it as punishment. They all offered animal sacrifices. This was every pagan ideology of the world in that time. So it's no wonder the Jews got caught up in that, especially being in captivity to the Babylonians. And right. this was kind of the message of Jesus and his disciples was like, you guys went astray when you became obsessed with these animal sacrifices. And God has always said, what I want is obedience to my commandments. And that is the way you demonstrate your love for God. That's why Jesus said, don't call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right. But only the one who does the will of my Father. Mm -hmm. And in another passage, someone says, Lord, what commandment should I follow to enter into eternal life? And the Jesus, according to Paul, should have said, oh, you don't enter eternal life by obeying commandments. There's no one righteous, not even one. You have to confess me as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> that clearly would have been what he said if right. Paul's version of Jesus was true. And what does Jesus say? He says, if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. And he says, which ones? And he says, love the Lord your God, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. He lists the Ten Commandments. And then he's, the guy says, Lord, all of these I have kept from my womb. And then he says, great. Now, if you want to be made perfect, 
sell everything you possess to the poor and come follow me. So he was saying, great, you've got eternal life, but if you want to go even higher than that, if you want to go for perfection, sell everything and be my disciple. So he never told anybody, confess me as Lord. He never called himself God. In fact, he put was, people down for he calling was, he him was that. uncomfortable. He was like, don't call me good. Only God is good. When people tried to worship him, don't worship me, only, only worship God. And he rebuked people in multiple occasions for calling him Lord because they didn't do what he said. They didn't follow his commandments. And that's just an absolute flagrant contradiction between the Christianity we know today that says, all you have to do is confess Jesus, just believe he died for your sins. That's all you have to do. And now you're going to heaven and you're saved. And Jesus said, ah, 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 away from me, you who practice wickedness, for I never knew you. Because, yeah, you called me Lord all day long, but when I was hungry, you didn't feed me, and on and on and on. So it's like we have two completely opposite gospel messages, and I think it behooves every Christian to come to understand this, that not only this this great uh, scholars call it the battle of the apostles, the fact that this is well documented in the Bible and especially outside the Bible in like first century sources, that the apostle Paul and Jesus's brother James and his 12 hand selected disciples were mortal enemies with each other. And they were trying to extinguish one another's gospels. We have Paul talking <laughs> about Jesus's disciples in his own writings. And then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which yeah, talk about the what I've I've heard of the Dead Sea oh, Scrolls. Oh man, this is juicy and I know, stuff. And I know when they came out, it was a, a, a ruckus. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> so can you talk? Can you go down the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the road a little bit with the DC? The, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the D DDS, yes. DSS. So, you know, on that note, when you when you learn about this, and it's undeniable when you see it, and I'm I'm doing a whole presentation next Saturday on this in uh, Forty University called the Gospel Conspiracy. Mm-hmm how the gospel of Jesus was replaced by the gospel of Paul. When you see it, you can't unsee it. And it behooves every confessing Christian to say, okay, I've got to make a real decision here. of Who do I think had Jesus's message right? Was it Jesus's brother and his 12 hand-selected disciples who in the New Testament, Jesus gave all his authority to them. And he even said, you 12 will rule over Israel on the 12 thrones. And he gave them his, his power to cast out demons and heal the sick. He mm-hmm. anointed them. Or was it a Pharisee Jew named Paul who never met Jesus and was a persecutor of Christians mm-hmm. most of his life until his big conversion experience? Which of those two camps do I trust more knew Jesus's message better? Right. Would it really not have been his own disciples? And what's funny is in Christianity, this is a whole, a whole denomination. It's called dispensationalism which says that, yes, in fact, Jesus's 12 disciples got it wrong. Paul got it right. And the reason that this this branch of Christianity developed is because this schism between Paul and Jesus's disciples is so obvious and clear and undeniable that you Christians can't just pretend it's not true anymore Mm -hmm. because they run a greater risk. They've got to have a better answer for it. And so they say it is actually true that Jesus's disciples missed it. And they they didn't understand his true message. And so Jesus had to reveal it to Paul privately after his death. (laughs) It's called dispensationalism, which means everything Jesus said in those red letters passed away once he rose from the dead. That was old covenant. And Jesus made a new covenant when he was crucified. And now we're under a new new law. So like Paul says, Jesus abolished the law of Moses. Paul said that the the law was a curse. The law of Moses was a curse and we're no longer under the curse thanks to Jesus's death. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he said, not a single iota of the law will pass away before heaven and earth themselves pass away. So it's basically, uh, Paul's like, well, that's old canon. Yes. So it doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't apply anymore. So Darth Vader... And Luke Skywalker, that's old stuff. In this new part, uh, this new thing, we're going to have Luke drinking uh, space milk, uh, green <laughs> space milk from uh, from a monster teat. Uh, yes. And that's new canon. And people who follow the old canon were yep. very upset about this new canon. Oh, yes. <laughs> so bring it down, back down. And I'll, I'll get into the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. But this is one of the amazing things in the New Testament is in the book of Acts, Paul gets called before the Jewish uh, church, this, the... James and the disciples 
a, a number of times in the book of Acts to come give an account of, hey, what are you preaching to people, dude? And when he goes before James, I believe in Acts 15, James, when they make almost no mention of James in the book of Acts or the whole New Testament, mm -hmm. which is like a huge scandal because mm -hmm. this is the appointed <laughs> successor of Jesus mm -hmm. and his own blood brother who was called James the Zadik, which is the highest honoring title in Essene Judaism, which means the righteous one, the teacher of righteousness. In Judaism, I believe this is in the Talmud, they believe that there's 36 Zadik on planet Earth at all times, that God keeps at least 36 anointed avatars. ones, avatars, yeah. righteous people, so that he doesn't have to destroy the world because of all the sinful karma. <laughs> okay. So it's, yeah. it's thanks to these 36 people minimum 36. God never lets it go below that, apparently. <laughs> it's thanks to these 36 Zadik that heaven and earth have come into being, that God does not destroy the earth because these righteous people live on earth. So it's like they're keeping us safe from wow. the wrath of God we deserve. The wrath, of course. So the they wrath. gave James the title of the Zadik, the teacher of righteousness, which was like the Pope of the Essenes. Uh, scholars believe it was probably John the Baptist, who was almost certainly Jesus's kind of guru or master. Jesus was clearly a disciple of John the Baptist. And then Jesus becomes his successor. He gets, John gets beheaded. And then Jesus becomes the new Zadik or teacher of righteousness. And then who did Jesus pass his title on to? It was James. So James was the Zadik or the just and his 12 apostles. Paul gets called before them and they make very little mention of James, but they do mention that he's the leader of the church. Mm -hmm. And James says to Paul, you, the Jews have been accusing you of apostasia is the Greek word, mm -hmm. that you are teaching them to forsake the commandments of Moses. And apostasy would be the greatest accusation you could make. And now the, the, new, the King James doesn't use the word apostasy because mm -hmm. that'd be way too harsh language <laughs> to let Christians read. They say, I can't remember what the word is, but it's like forsaking or that you're forsaking the law of Moses. But James said that you're committing apostasia. Mm-hmm teaching people not to follow the commandments of Moses. And Paul essentially denies it. No, 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 I would never teach that, which of course he was all through his epistles. The law of Moses is a curse. Don't follow it. It's Jesus abolished it. But when he's in front of the disciples, he's like, oh, I would never teach that. And they make him take the Nazarite vow to prove to everybody that he's not anti-law, but that he obeys the law. Mm -hmm. And he takes this Naz the seven day vow where he purifies himself and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And so it's this scandalous thing that the apostles are trying to call Paul into account for his teachings. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is the amazing story of the Dead Sea Scrolls that they were discovered in 1947, I believe. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, the Vatican sent its team over mm -hmm. to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they, they took the, the Catholic scholars, took the scrolls into the Rockefeller Library or Museum, and they kept them sequestered there for like 40 years without sharing them to the public. And you have all these scholars around the world, Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, non-Christian scholars who are dying to get their hands on these documents. In the Vatican, the French Catholics from the Vatican are like, nope, we've got them and we're doing our work on them. Don't worry, we'll let you know what they say. <laughs> so thanks to the work of a couple scholars named Robert Eisenman and Michael Wise in the late 80s, early 90s, they went to legal war with the Vatican scholars saying, you guys don't have the right to keep these documents to yourself. And they eventually won, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were released to the public, and then all the scholars started tearing into them. And now what the, what the Vatican scholars, the Catholic scholars said was, oh, these are a bunch of scrolls by ancient an ancient sect called the Essenes. And so they're not Christian documents. They're not from the early Christian movement. Don't worry, nothing to see here. Just a couple hundred years before that from the Essenes. And what's funny is there's no mention of the word Essenes in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everything that we know about the Essenes from like Josephus and Pliny and Philo, mm -hmm. that they were vegetarians, they were super anti-war pacifists, uh, they lived in the Qumran Desert, on and on and on. All the documents in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls are very opposite of that. They're very like, they call them uh, the zealots. They're very zealotous documents, meaning they're, they're all about the end of the age, they're apocalyptic, they're messianic, they're about going to war with the, the dark forces of the world and this great apocalypse is coming where God's gonna judge everyone. And they're, they're very uh, warlike almost, which was classic Judaism of the first century. It's kind of like militant Islam. 
they were very militant about their faith and um, zealous for the law. So the, the Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars are going over these documents being like, there's no mention of Essenes here. Like there's some correlations, but like there's a whole lot of other stuff here that's making us scratch our heads. And one of the words that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the Nazarim and the Ebian, mm-hmm. Ebians, which means the poor ones. And so the Ebionites is a sect of early Christians that first, second, and third century scholars and historians document that they were vehemently against Paul the apostle. Mm-hmm. They called him an apostate. They said that he was deceived by a demon who was pretending to be Jesus <laughs> in order to corrupt Jesus's gospel. Mm-hmm. And when you study the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's these themes that keep appearing. They talk about the Zadik, the Zadik, the Zadik, the teacher of righteousness. We know that that was James's name, title given. They talk about this person called the spouter of lies and the law-free liar. And they paint this story in so many of these documents, the Habakkuk Pesher and um, the, the War Scroll, where they're talking about the teacher of righteousness versus the spouter of lies and that the spouter of lies had come from within their own camp, that he was a Jew basically Mm -hmm. who had gone astray and was spouting lies and the law free liars, a pretty descriptive (laughs) term for it. And then another uh, figure called the wicked priest who eventually kills the teacher of righteousness. And this is what happened to James. He was killed by Ananus, the high priest. He was stoned to death very unjustly. And it caused such an uproar among the Jews Mm -hmm. that Ananus was deposed from his station as high priest by Agrippa because he's like, dude, you stirred up all the Jews to this riot because you killed their favorite guy. (laughs) Get out of here, man. I'm I'm trying to keep the peace. You're ruining my peace, right? So he deposes Ananus and then the followers of James uh, murder him and parade his body through the streets. This is on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's um, in Josephus and some first century historians, they parade his body and violate his body in the streets Mm -hmm. uh, to make a mockery of him because James the Just was so revered and respected and well-loved. I mean, you can imagine Mm -hmm. he's the brother of Jesus. And Josephus and Philo and Eusebius, these writers talk about James like he was just a little bit beneath Jesus in people's eyes because he was Jesus's appointed successor and his own blood brother. So like, of course, they revered him as a Christ-like figure. And this wicked priest, Ananus, has him stoned without a trial. It was a scandalous thing, and he paid big time for it. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls document this using this language of the wicked priest killing the teacher of righteousness who was trying to um, disprove the spouter of lies and his false doctrine. And you're like, James, Paul, Ananus, these characters fit perfectly into the figures talked about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then on top of that, all of the coins that they found, this is the kicker, Mm -hmm. they found coins scattered all throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they all date exactly in the first century Jesus movement of Palestine, when James the Just was the leader of the Christian church for 30 years, 44 AD to 66 AD, just before Rome got destroyed, Jerusalem got destroyed by Rome. All the coins date to those exact dates. It's almost like the universe left a trail of coins (laughs) to be like, no denying when these texts were written and what generation they came from. So the Ebionites means the poor ones. And that comes from Jesus' teaching, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So they were called Nazarenes and Ebionites, were the interchangeable words, and followers of the way. And this is all through the book of Acts these definitions, the way, the Nazarenes, the first Christian sect, Paul is accused of being a Nazarene and follower of the way Mm -hmm. by the Jewish Sanhedrin. So it's in the Bible, it's in extra biblical sources, and it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, three different sources confirming that these texts were the actual scrolls of James the Just and Jesus's 12 disciples from the first century. These are the Christian scrolls of Jesus's movement that they had to bury in these caves to keep them from the Inquisition of Rome, burning them like they did all the other sacred texts. Mm -hmm. It's basically the library of Jerusalem that they took out into the desert to preserve it with all of these Nazarene documents. And so this is a scandalous, explosive discovery that we, it's hard to put it into words actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest, this makes the, um, what's the the Da Vinci Code? Mm 
This makes the Da Vinci Code look like child's play, honestly. Really? With how explosive this is, that there was an absolute schism between Paul and the disciples. Again, it, it forces every Christian to... Because what if this is true, right? If you're a Christian listening to this, what if this is true, that your master Jesus had his gospel distorted and changed over time and lost to time, and you've been following mostly a false gospel of his, wouldn't it behoove you to want to do the research to confirm if that's true? And if there was this great schism between Paul and the disciples, doesn't that put an onus on you to decide whose gospel do I trust more? But, uh, but Aaron, it's a lot easier just to go along with the program, sir. <laughs>